We seem to have lost. We have not lost. To refuse to fight would have been to lose. To fight is to win. We have kept faith with the past and handed on a tradition to the future. Patrick Pierce. Pierce is normally remembered in history for his role as the president of the provisional government during the Easter Rising in 1916. A, a role which he has become famous and infamous for over time. Some quarters it is acceptable to dismiss him as an apostle of blood sacrifice. For others, he is lauded as a heroic self-sacrificing gentleman who woke Ireland up. My own family would fall squarely into the latter camp when I was growing up. Pierce was seen as a, a heroic figure. The real truth is, I would say somewhere between them. Pierce is certainly heroic, but there are touches of idealism that seem utopian at, at times in him. However, there is a side to him which is rarely discussed and is just as important as his role as a revolutionary. That's his role as an educationalist, which I'd like to touch on. Before I do, though, some basic background about Pierce as a historical figure might be useful for people not familiar with him. Pierce, although he has become an icon of Irishness, was in fact half English. His father was originally a Unitarian from Birmingham, and his mother was Irish. His, their marriage was a second marriage for Pierce's father. Pierce's father himself could do with some attention, as he was a stonemason of some note. And if you wander around Dublin, you can find his sculptures adorning numerous graves and churches. Although he was never trained professionally, his work is of a very high quality, and I aim to intend to find some pictures to stick up here to show that. He ran a fairly successful funeral director's company as well. Pierce was part of the, what might be called the, the middle class of Ireland. He went on to obtain an, a BA and an MA and was in theory a barrister, although he only ever had what, participated in one case. He however also ran a school, St Enders, which was revolutionary in the way it approached education. There is a particular pamphlet by him called The Murder Machine, which lambasts British and Irish education of its day. I'm going to touch on that in the next section. One of the mottos most associated with Pierce is Tirgar and Chunga, which means roughly translated, a country without a language is a country without a heart. This was this motto guided Pierce in his educational efforts throughout. St. Enders focused on the teaching of Irish and encouraged Irish pupils not to be ashamed of their culture or heritage, but to celebrate it. Not to imagine that their heritage was more mean-spirited than England, but it was the equal of England's. In this, I would say... Ironically, Pierce is indebted to his father to some extent, who seems to have been a free thinker of some note, and who Pierce um, comments on his own in his own work with encouraging him as extending his mind and not taking easy answers to questions. I'm going to go into some detail about how St. Ender was organised as well. St. Ender was essentially a school with no physical punishment. Pierce detested physical punishment for children. He believed it crippled children mentally and spiritually. It was never used in any of the schools he ran. His book, The Murder Machine, or pamphlet rather, comments that Irish education as it stood in his day was set to breed slaves. It existed to reinforce the notion that the Irish were part of, and sub of the United Kingdom and subservient to it. The idea that they were equal or could ever rise above to the level of an independent nation of their own was strictly clamped down on for very obvious reasons. Pierce is often seen as humorless. I think the preface of the murder machine would suggest that that's far from the case. Preface, this pamphlet is not, as its name might seem to import, a penny dreadful, at least in the ordinary sense. It consists of a series of studies of the English education system in Ireland. The article entitled The Murder Machine embodies an article which appeared in the Irish Review for February 1913. The article called An Ideal in Education was printed in the Irish Review for June 1914. The rest of the pamphlet is a collation of notes made for a lecture which I delivered in the Dublin Mansion House in December 1912. P. H. Pierce, St. Enders College, Rat Farnham, 1st of January 1916. The Broad Arrow. A French writer has paid the English a very well-deserved compliment. He says that they never commit a useless crime. 
When they hire a man to assassinate an Irish patriot, when they blow a sepoy from the mouth of a cannon, when they produce a family in one of their dependencies, they always have an ulterior motive. They do not do it for fun. Humorous as these crimes are is not the humour of them, but the utility that appeals to the English. Unlike Gilbert's Mikado, they would see nothing humorous in boiling oil. If they retained boiling oil in their penal code, they would retain it as they retain flogging before execution in Egypt, strictly because it has been found useless. Useful, rather. This observation will help one to an understanding of some portion of the English administration of Ireland. The English administration of Ireland has not been marked by any necessary, unnecessary cruelty. Every crime that the English have planned and carried out in Ireland has had a very definite end. Every absurdity they have set up has a grave purpose. Even the famine was not enacted merely from a love and horror. The boards that rule Ireland were not contrived in order to add to the gaiety of nations. The famine and the boards alike are parts of a profound polity. I have spent the greater part of my life in immediate contemplation of the most grotesque and horrible of the inventions for the debasement of Ireland, their educational system. The English once proposed in their Dublin Parliament a, a measure for the castration of all Irish priests if refused to quit Ireland. The proposal was so filthy, although it duly passed the House and was transmitted to England with the raw own recommendation of the voice right, it was not eventually adopted. But the English have actually carried out an even filthier thing. They have planned and established an education system which more wickedly does violence to the elementary rights of the Irish children than would a need act for the general castration of Irish males. The system has aimed at the substitution of men and women of mere things. And as unfortunately was our school way ahead of its time. And by the time we reached 1916, it was beginning to fail and fall into death. Pierce had invested large sums of his own money in it and tried to raise funds as far as possible from anyone he could get to invest in, in the um, idea. But as an educational system, it was leagues ahead of the thinking of its day. It was regarded with suspicion also by the authorities due to its nationalist and republican chain as they saw it. I would say Pierce's work as an educationalist is paralleled by many independent struggles, where those who come from the middle classes are often those who spark the revolution. The peasantry lack the education to do, uh, to do so, but they do provide the main bulk of the, those who will be involved in a revolt. And Pierce did not underestimate their intelligence, and indeed identified with them more than he did with the middle classes. Although he's normally seen as socially conservative due to his Catholicism, which was an integral part of his personality, it's notable that the Dublin lockout of 1930, which involved working class people rebelling against the obnoxious policies of the factory owners and the huge hours they were expected to work, saw Pierce coming down firmly on the side of the workers and noticing that the way the employers ran their system was not something that could be considered godlike or in keeping with uh, any form of charity he was aware of. This was to some degree unexpected because of his social conservatism and led to him forging closer links with socialist elements in Ireland at the time. Whether he would have eventually ever moved close to their position is of course something we shall never know due to his death at the hands of a British firing squad after, 19, after Easter 1916. All the Easter Rising leaders have careers outside being simply revolutionaries, and Pierce's career as an educationalist is something the Irish government could look to today, as in many respects his comments about education are still very, very prescient.